For those that don't know me properly, Paige and I, we moved back from Sydney. I was there nine years, Paige was there seven. Um, we were over there studying at Hillsong College and then we set up our life there and never thought we'd move back to Adelaide. All of our families here, but it was not in our plan to move back at all. And then, thus saith the Lord, move back, so we did. And here we are. It's been a year and a half now, and the way he's moving is just incredible because it's the pursuit of Jesus. It's all about him and what he wants. It's the best place to be is in the will of the Father. So I'm going to start by reading a scripture. And it's in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, and I'll be reading it from the New King James. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, my first question is, what is scripture to you? Where is the authority? Is this the final authority of our life? Is this everything? Because we're taught and we're told that this is everything. That what this book says from Genesis to Revelation should guide every part of our life and we should be in full knowing and full surrender to what is in this book. And it's a beautiful story of restoration of humanity back to the Father. But do we live with this as the highest authority? Do we live with this above everything else in our life? So this morning we're going to be talking about the narrow gate, the narrow way that Jesus taught us. The way that is only to him. The way that is the only way to the Father. That without this, we actually miss everything. And we're going to unpack that and look deeper into it. But before we do, during my preparation, I, every, well, every day I pray to the Lord, humble me and keep me humble. And, you know, it's not always the greatest prayer because he will. You pray it and he will. Trust me. (laughs) But in preparation for this, I felt overwhelmed with how much there is in what Jesus taught and how much there is in Scripture that relates to the narrow way that he spoke, even though there's only a few small spots in Scripture where he actually speaks directly about it. So as I laid, well, as I sat there and prayed this prayer, Lord, keep me humble. He showed me that he can't, I can't do this alone. And he showed me all the sermons that we've been hearing for the past 12 months or so, the incredible people that have been speaking and trusting and leaning on God and hearing his voice It's all about the narrow way. It's all about the way that leads to Jesus. We've heard King David, a man after God's own heart. We've heard Holy Spirit as a whisper. We've heard how now shall we live. We've heard about pride twice in about eight months. We've heard God and his kingdom at night. We've heard about baggage and what we carry. We've heard about fatherly love and forgiveness. We've heard about God is our help. From the Psalms, we've heard about relationships. We've heard about defeating the impact of offense, the power of the kingdom, purpose, holiness, identity, unity, Satan's side trackers, tough love, the fear of God, and it's all about Jesus. And he showed me that what I bring today isn't actually about what I bring today. It's about what's being brought by his voice across this church and across the body of Christ, that he is calling us back to him. He's calling us to such a great intimacy with Jesus like we've never experienced before. So, let's begin. Who is Jesus to you? Is he the narrow Is he the only way? 
Is he everything to us? Matthew 7, 13 to 14 in the New King James. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. This is a snippet from a um, commentary that I have from Craig Keener, and it really sums up a lot of these passages. I'm about to first read from Luke, which is another instance of Jesus talking about the narrow way, and then we're going to hear this observation that I think just brings so much weight. So Luke 13, 22 to 30, the New King James again. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you toured in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are the last who will be first, and there are the first who will be last. Now, this snippet, we'll go to that. It's going to be a lot of scripture and a lot of reading, and it's good because it's everything, right? The image of the two ways was common in Jewish and other ancient literature. Some texts also stressed that the majority of people would follow the way of destruction. Other Jewish groups beside Christians believed that there were only one saved group, but many mainstream Jews apparently believed that nearly all Israel would be saved in the time to come. Now, the word destruction gets used a few times. And uh, forgive me, Christos, wherever you are, but it is the word Apollyon in the Greek. And it means ruin, loss, damnation, destruction, perish, and waste. Jesus isn't just talking to us about something small in this passage. He's talking us talking to us about eternity. He's talking to us about the only way to the Father, what he came to accomplish on the cross. He's telling us that the only way we can actually get there is through the Father. The only way to the Father, sorry, the only way is through him. The other way leads to destruction. It, it, that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> Ruin, loss, damnation, die, perish, waste. That's the other way. It's heavy, isn't it? But, you know, we've been hearing sermons about the fear of God and his holiness and how powerful he is and that his ways are so much higher than our ways. Jesus is the only way to the Father. There is no other way. We don't get a golden ticket just for getting up here and preaching or prophesying out the people or eating and drinking in his name and encouraging people. Don't get me wrong, they're all important and they're all a part of it. But if they're the things we're focusing on and we're not focusing on Jesus and a relationship with him and intimacy with him like no other, then we're missing it. Because he actually will say to people, depart from me. 
when they get to that stage. And that's what we're going to read now in Matthew 7, 21 to 23 in the New King James. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, not, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Gary keeps mentioning, which I said before, that we're seeking Jesus, we're not seeking the miracles, we're not seeking the wonders. They're a part of it, but they're not it. He's it. That's what this scripture is talking about. Just because we prophesy, just because we cast out, just because we do these things, it doesn't mean that we actually know him. That's why we pray, Lord, humble us. Keep us on track with him. Forgive us our sins. There's a lot in that, isn't there? The word lawlessness in the Greek means anomian. Without law because of ignorance. Contempt of law, unrighteousness. Isn't it interesting? Because of ignorance. How much do we do in life where we're just actually ignorant to stuff? I know I do. We don't know everything. But we've got to be in that constant place of surrender to him, don't we? To the Lord Jesus. Do we align with the will of the Father or of our own? You know, Paige and I moving back here wasn't because we thought it would be a good idea. We would have stayed in Sydney. We loved the life that we had there. It was amazing. Paige was in her dream, dream job. We had awesome friends, we were a part of an awesome church, and we loved our time there. But what's greater, our will or his? It's his. So he says speak, he says go, and we go. It means you give up things that you may not want to give up. But boy, are we glad for the life that we have now, all because of him that we couldn't have even imagined what he had in store for us. At the moment, in the world, we have the most knowledge we've ever had in history. We know everything. I'm standing here pulling out Greek words and their meaning from Scripture, and we understand so much of Scripture. We understand so much of what's going on in the world with world news, with social media, with all this connection. Yet I dare to say that it's actually brought us further away from the heart of Jesus than ever. Because everything's accessible, yet we've got to trust in him by faith. And we've been hearing these testimonies of what he's doing. He's showing us that he's the one working. No amount of study in scripture. It'll help to get us closer to Jesus. But if that's the focus, we're going to miss the heart of Jesus. We're going to miss that intimate relationship with him. And my heart breaks knowing that there are going to be people that get to the end, that believe they have been doing everything for the Lord and he's going to say, depart from me. I don't know about you, but that shatters my heart. Not only for other people, but for myself. Lord, may that not be me. May that not be us. And my heart is that will be none of us that none of us will get to the end and hear depart from me, that we will get there and we will hear well done, good and faithful, that we will do it for the relationship with Jesus because he is the narrow way. He is the only way to the Father. We can't get there without him. And I'm going to stress on this point because we can't. And that's why we've been hearing these sermons that we've been hearing. We're understanding and getting this full picture that he's either God of everything or he's God of nothing, as we've heard Gary say a lot of times. This is either everything or it's nothing. There's no in-between. There's no in the middle. And it's not a burden. It's exciting. 
It's exciting that we get to. It's exciting that we have the opportunity every single day to meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that we can be driving in a car, we can be sitting at home, we can be making a cup of tea, we can be at work, we can be wherever we may be, and we can meet with the King of Kings. We can meet with the Creator. We can have community with Him. You don't have to come to these four walls, to this building, to meet with Him. Sarah spoke about Holy Spirit as a whisper, being with Holy Spirit at all times. He's everywhere, and he wants to be with us. He wants it so much. But do we? Do we allow him into every area? Do we let him have everything? I've seen two sides of what eternity may look like in my time, in close proximity. In 2010, I lost my oldest brother, who was nine years older than me, through a tragic situation that I'm not going to go into details with purely for time. But God used it for good, and God brought salvation through it. And he brought me to his feet through all of that. So I stand here so grateful that he took me on the journey that he did despite the heartache. However, my oldest brother, Nathan, he loved the Lord. And we had confirmation after confirmation that he was with the Lord. It's beautiful, right? Well done, good and faithful. Well, in the last two weeks, my nana, on the other hand, we lost. And she's passed away after a long life of torment and pain. And she did not love the Lord that we know. Who knows in her last moments? God does. We don't. But two sides. Did she get, well done, good and faithful, or did she get, depart from me? We have no idea. There's a gravity in that. Because this life is all about eternity. How we live day to day is all about eternity. And I believe God's gracious, and I believe that by his grace she may be saved, that she may be with the Lord, for she had a life of torment. In Jesus' name, may she not have a life, an eternity of pain. However, is that up to me? Nope. That's up to him. But when those sorts of things happen, they really bring a perspective, don't they? We're living for eternity. And we need to be living for Jesus in all things, surrendering everything to him. Everything. And I mean everything. We've heard addictions be spoken about. Haven't we? There have been some amazing sermons where we've heard about all these various things that we need to surrender to God. And let him be God. So, my next point. Well, my next question. What is Jesus worth to you? Is he worth everything? Or is he only worth some things? There are so many scriptures that I have here that I'm probably not even going to get time to read. there's so much in Jesus' teaching and Paul's teaching, which is all about holy living, all about how we should live. We've got a pretty good roadmap of what our lives should look like when you look at the scriptures, don't we? A lot of stuff is very black or white. You don't get a lot of grey. But do we surrender them? Do we surrender all of it to him? Do we look at the fruit of our life and go, does this align with what Jesus taught us to look, how Jesus taught us to look? Does it align with what Paul wrote in all of his letters to so many churches, how they should be living? Jesus, last week, Gary said, to quote Gary once again, last week, Gary said, Jesus Christ is the answer, the whole answer. Without him, we're not going to get very far. So, let's go to some more scripture. Matthew seven fifteen 
to 20 in the New Living Translation. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but who are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can, can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yeah. Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. There's a lot in that, isn't it? When we look at the fruit of our lives, do we actually look at the fruit of our lives? Do we actually think about our actions, our conversations? Again, it's like the prayer humble me. It's not very fun, but what it does for us puts us on that narrow way puts us on the way that Jesus taught us how to live. Do we surrender it all to him? When we pray these prayers, Lord, show me my fruit. What's bad? Help me. We've got an incredible community here of people that will do it alongside you, that will help you to understand how to live the way the Lord wants us to live. And we're never going to be perfect because otherwise there'd be no need for Jesus. That's just the reality. We're never going to be perfect until eternity. We ain't going to get there. But if we're not trying, then we've missed it completely. The whole point is the pursuit. I love Paul. He puts a lot of things very clearly. I think sometimes he just started getting a bit frustrated with some of the churches, so he started getting a bit more direct. But let's go with Romans 6.19 in the New King James. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. I don't know, he's, he's said it really easily, hasn't he? But now we're going we're gonna to come in with Galatians 5, 13 to 23 in the New King James. Once again, Paul. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, But through love, serve one another. For the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you are consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and like the other of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against there is, such, there is no such law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. 
And those who are Christ's have been crucified, have crucified the flesh. Are we Christ's? Is he everything? Are we in the narrow way? Are we in the narrow gate where we have surrendered all things, where we have surrendered the movies we watch, the TV shows we watch, what we listen to, how we are when we're around people? You know, insert any human task into that bracket. <laughs> are, we, are we surrendering it to him? Are we allowing him to have all of us? God of everything, right? Of everything. Because this is eternity that's on the line. It's eternity. I'd rather give up what doesn't please the Lord in this time and be standing with him ruling and reigning in eternity. Then allow this life to consume me and get to that final time and wonder, is he going to say depart from me or is he going to say well done, good and faithful? There's a weight that we need, to, we need to let sink into our hearts with this. It's all about Jesus and we've got to let him be God. We've got to let him take all of it. So what is he worth to you? Is he worth everything? It's a question that only you can answer. Because all of this is about a relationship with him. It doesn't matter what anyone else knows or thinks. It's all about him. If the worship team want to come up, I'm going to come in. Come in for the close. Again, this sermon shouldn't be taken in light of just this time with the narrow gate. It really needs to be taken in with all the other ones that we've been hearing. And if you want to go back, they're all on YouTube. You can jump on and watch any of them back again and see if the Lord speaks to you in another way through it. Because, man, he's speaking. He's taken us somewhere. And I don't want to miss it. I don't know about you. I truly, in my heart of hearts, believe he is calling us to a higher standard of living. He is calling us back to a relationship with him where he is everything. Back to a unity with him, with Jesus, for his soon returning, the scriptures say, yet we've been living like it's going to be another few thousand years. What if it's not? No one knows the time or the hour, but what if it's not? What if it's tomorrow? The scriptures say that people will still be getting married. They'll still be eating and drinking at the time of his return. Life will be normal and you think, oh, no, that won't be me. Maybe it will. You'll be down in Pasadena getting your groceries and then, bam, Jesus is here. We don't know, do we? But the scripture tells us that stuff's going to happen. We're being called back to a holy and set-apart life in full pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only way. He is the straight and the narrow, and he is the only way to the Father. Our relationship with him means everything. My prayer is that when that day comes, we're all going to stand there as a body of Christ. Whatever part of that body we are, whether we're the little toe or a strand of hair, that he's going to come back and say, well done, good and faithful, because we've been in wholehearted pursuit of Jesus, that we've allowed him to be everything. So as we go back into some worship, his presence has been here all morning, and he's been moving and working let him have everything. Every bit. 
I don't know your story, I don't know your life, but I know I've gone through a lot of rocky stuff in my life, and the only thing that got me through the death of my brother was him. Otherwise, completely honest, I would have taken my own life. But he's everything. So, let's pray and then go for it. Lord Jesus, how great you are. Only by you may we receive salvation, forgiveness of our sins. Holy Spirit, may you keep us on the straight and narrow. May you keep us in full pursuit of you, laying down the things of our life, what we hold dear to us, may we lay it before your feet and allow you to be God. Humble our hearts that we can actually let you be God. We love you. We give you everything and we mean everything every part of our life, whether good, whether bad, whether seen, whether unseen, to you, it matters. And we surrender it to you. You are so holy and so good. Help us to live for you in all things, to be ready for your soon coming. In your holy, holy name we pray. Thank you, Jesus.